Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Teresa Soto, and I am the Ruth R. Martyr Director of Learning and Community Engagement at the Walters Art Museum. I'm excited to introduce today's program, The Depths of History, Navigating Institutional Legacies and Charting a More Equitable Future. And many thanks to all of you who are joining us today. I'm honored and humbled to introduce today's program and be in dialogue with our esteemed panelists, whom I will introduce to you shortly. This program is particularly significant to me, as it marks the first time that I am on stage at the Walters Art Museum, which is the first art museum that I remember visiting as a young teenager. I recall walking into, the muse into this museum and feeling incredibly curious by the objects that I saw and the stories that they told, but also feeling awkward. From a young age, my parents had instilled in me a love of learning, but they didn't have time to take me to art museums, so I wasn't sure what I was supposed to do in one. I saw others navigating the galleries confidently, and it was clear that there were histories and narratives that I was supposed to already know. But as a daughter of immigrants from the Philippines, I was not familiar with the culture of American museums, especially those that were deemed, quote, encyclopedic, even though they left out my culture entirely. In recent years, museums as well as universities have been increasingly contending with their exclusionary histories, examining whose histories have been left out and expanding and being transparent about these histories with the public. I am proud to be working at such an institution. The Walters Art Museum is committed to making accessible the histories of its origins and the art that it stewards in order to ensure an environment of anti-racism, inclusivity, collaboration, and welcome for all. Today's program is the first in a new series at the Walters, The Depths of History. This program series investigates and interrogates the problematic histories of museums and other institutions. And I'm honored to share the stage with an impressive panel and be in dialogue about institutions that have evolved from their legacies. Together, we will discuss how institutions contend with the racist legacies of their founders and the complications inherent in mining and sharing these problematic histories. And so I'm going to go ahead and introduce our panelists from left to right. Julia Marchiari, Marchiari Alexander is the Walters Andrea B. and John H. Laporte Director. She has served as Executive Director and CEO of the Walters Art Museum since 2013. The fifth director of the Walters, Julia is the first woman to hold the post. She has had a lifelong passion for art history, having caught the art history bug in sixth grade. Her 25-year career includes serving as curator, then associate director at the Yale Center for British Art, as well as head curator, and then interim director at San Diego Museum of Art. Julia is a champion of increasing access to the arts, stemming not just from her professional pursuits, but also from her experience as a proud mother of twins, one of whom lives with juvenile arthritis. Her personal journey Advocating for disability rights has bolstered her resolve in centering access as a core institutional value at the Walters. Kurt von Dack is a thought leader in truth-telling and reconciliation projects within educational institutions. He is assistant dean and professor in the College of Arts and Sciences at the University of Virginia, where he co-chaired the UVA President's Commission on Slavery for seven years. He now co-chairs the UVA President's Commission on the University in the Age of Segregation. Since 2016, he has been the managing director of University Studying Slavery, a UVA-led consortium of over 80 schools in five countries. His first book, Freedom Has a Face, Race, Identity, and Community in Jefferson's Virginia examined the struggles of free black people as they sought security 
Economic Success, Community, and Rights in Virginia Slave Society. And he is currently editing a volume, After Emancipation, A History of Race, Community, and the University of Virginia, with the University of Virginia Press. Quite a CV. And last but certainly not least, Martha S. Jones is the Society of Black Alumni Presidential Professor, Professor of History, and a Professor at the SNF Agora Institute at the Johns Hopkins University. Her impressive career is multidimensional, spanning public and academic spheres. As a legal and cultural historian, she examines how black Americans have shaped the story of American democracy. As an author, she has published titles such as Vanguard, How Black Women Broke Barriers, Won the Vote, and Insisted on Equ Equality for All, which was selected as one of Time's 100 must-read books for 2020 as well as the award-winning book, Birthright Citizens, A History of Race and Rights in Antebellum America. As a public historian, she has written for broader audiences, such as the New York Times and USA Today. And as a consultant, she has provided valuable expertise to museum and video productions, including the Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery, the Charles Wright Museum of African American History, PBS American Experience, and Netflix. I am so excited to be on stage with this esteemed group of individuals. Each of our panelists represent institutions for which one man is associated with its founding. And although we think of those individuals shaping an institution at its inception, we have to acknowledge that the institution has evolved and grown in ways that the founder, if still alive, would not be interested in and may in fact disagree with. So Julia, I'd love for you to please kick us off by commenting on why the Walters has simultaneously delved into the histories of our museum's founders while you, as our leader, the executive director, move the institution in new directions. Thank you, Teresa, and really thank you for coming to the Walters. It is such an honor to be here with you and with both of you today, um, but it really is a pleasure to welcome you to the Walters. Thank you for coming. Thanks, Julia. Um, so thank you all for being here today, and I think that um, as, as institutions, museums really haven't changed much in 250 years. There are some industries and some institutions that just really have been very, very good at doing what they do and not really thinking about how to move forward. And in the last 20 years, we have all, as museum directors and museum professionals, really started to think about, wait, do we want to be that textbook that you've wrapped in the paper bag, that you've spent a lot of time protecting, that you're not actually thinking about differently as you read it, but you're just taking in the lists and the, um, the facts that are presented there as the whole set of facts. Um, and we've realized that actually museums are like those textbooks and have been. They've been put together by individuals, whether that be founders or collectors or donors or curators or executive directors who are using art as it has always throughout history and across the world um, to create a narrative that is in the interest of their time and to use that narrative to help shape the values and the cultures in which they sit. And so in that sense, these institutions really um, have been part of a, a, a system of sort of installing and lifting and celebrating only certain ideas about culture and life. And when we do dis, sort of disaggregate our histories, what we do is we create a museum of something else. So you'll have the museum of, you'll have the Metropolitan Museum, and then next to it you'll have the National Portrait Gallery, as if portraits are separate from what you see in the museum. Or you have the Yale Center for British Art, which looks at British art, but what is British art? And why is that sitting across from the Yale University Art Gallery, which purports to be the encyclo encyclopedic museum of the two? So the different stories serve the interests, good, bad, happy, sad, of those people who are part of the history of the institution. And when I came on board, the 
the board had been really thinking about and the staff had been thinking about how can the art the Walters Art Museum actually take a leading role in helping shape what a 21st century museum could be and so what what we did was we embarked in 2015 on a kind of new way of thinking about how we wanted to approach our work and could I have the first slide please um, and that coming together of ideas. Actually, could we do the second slide first? And like quiz show, I'll have the first, I'll take the second question first. Um, and what we did was we really came together around the idea that we would look to the buildings that we sit in as objects in our collections, that we wanted to make sure we put the people who were involved with the art back into the art, be that the makers of the art, the patrons of the art, the residents of the buildings, in this case, Hackerman House um, at 1 West Mount Vernon Place, the uh, builders, the enslaved individuals who were living, forced to live in and work in those spaces. And you can see here that Sibby Grant um, was an enslaved cook who lived in this house right at the moment of its building. Um, and um, there's a whole story that we were able to uncover and expand our understanding of One West Mount Vernon Place as an, as an entity in and of itself by looking to her and thinking about how she lived, worked, and was, was really hidden, literally hidden in the spaces of that house um, during her lifetime. And what we wanted to do was to kind of come around over the course of our first, my first near decade, and, and start to think differently about what our purpose as a civic institution was. And that was to create a rubric about expanding, not creating new histories, but expanding the stories and the histories that we talk about directly and commit to continuing to learn about all of the different facets of our work. And so that is what last year in, and you can now maybe slip back, that is what last year we debuted along with a publication of our DEAI goals. We launched a new About the Walters that not only um, widened the lens on our collection and really questions what the notion of an encyclopedic collection is. Um, an encyclopedia is always and forever will be incomplete and it is selected by whoever is writing it. And so we are questioning in our labels and in our displays, you know, what is missing and who are we including? And then also really confronting and making plain and direct the factual information that has been available for a very long time about the role of our founders, William and Henry Walters, and their activity, sympathy for, and activities in support of the Confederacy and later on the lost cause. And I know that Martha will, I hope, talk a little bit about some things she's recently found out that we will be adding um, at some point with her to our history. And the idea is, again, not to um, close down conversation, but to bring into at, to the fore these conversations about how institutions are formed and what they represent and how we, in our moment, need to use them to create a better future. And I was really moved, um, as everyone, I think, was when Amanda Gord Gorman last year said, was it two years ago now, um, she said, we need, um, we step into the past, and that is how we repair it. And that is our purpose. We have historic collections, historic buildings, and it's our responsibility to step into that past and connect with it and speak honestly and directly about it so that we actually can make a different future for ourselves. So I hope I answered your question, Teresa. That was perfect, Julia, thank you. And um, it's really interesting to um, hear about how the Walters has expanded its histories and, and really really purposefully using that word expansion. Um, and I'm wondering, Martha, if you could also share a little bit about how um, at Johns Hopkins, there's also been an expansion of the histories that, that the institution is telling about its founder. So um, thanks so much um, to you, Teresa. Um, to you, Julia, 
um, it's really an honor to be here and to be in um, a long conversation with you all, um, and this afternoon being one chapter, I think, in a much broader discussion. I, I want to thank Kurt, who has been um, a colleague and friend to us at Johns Hopkins um, and has really set the bar high for our work um, through his work at the University of Virginia, which I know we're going to hear uh, more about. So I can't imagine a better place to be sitting to talk um, some about what we've been doing. Um, one of the hats I wear at Johns Hopkins is I am the director of a project we call Hard Histories at Hopkins. Um, I came to Baltimore in uh, the fall of 2017, um, a historian of Baltimore, of early Baltimore, uh, but not someone who ever imagined she would be um, diving deep into um, the annals of the university um, of Mr. Hopkins and more. Um, but like so many Americans, I mean, so many American institutions, in the summer of 2020, um, our consciousness was raised once again, um, urgently so, around um, race, racism, justice, and more. Um, and by a quirky turn of events, um, we were presented with new uh, documents, um, new insights into our founder, um, Mr. Hopkins having held enslaved people in his household here in Baltimore in 1840 and 1850 and found ourselves and I found myself um, stepping into um, a new and I think um, important chapter not only in the history of the university but it turns out in the history of Baltimore City um, and so I'm really honored to be here. Maybe I could show um, this, my second slide first, just to, <laughs> in keeping with the tradition, um, because um, Baltimoreans may re may recognize this um, spot, and if you don't know it, it's just quite outside the door here um, in the North Park um, at Monument Square. Um, when I moved here in 2017, um, this plinth was right outside my front door, and um, on it sat uh, one time U.S. Chief Justice Roger Brooke Tawney. Um, so this is um, how it looks today, um, and folks may remember um, that following on um, tragic events in Charlottesville, Virginia, and maybe we'll get to talk more about that, Kurt, um, in here in Baltimore, um, four um, so-called Confederate monuments were removed, and Justice Tawney's um, likeness was removed from this pedestal um, in the summer of 2018. Am I right? No, it was actually 2017. 2017. Thank you. But see, right you I have COVID time, and I it's very vacation. difficult I to do that. <laughs> um, um, and I wanted to start here in part um, as a way of um, situating ourselves and encouraging all of us to find out where we sit in these histories. Um, I was a newcomer to Baltimore. I had come here to take a job, um, but all of a sudden I was um, seeing the fabric of my work, the fabric of my life, I don't know, becoming um, enmeshed with one another in real time um, in the city. Um, and uh, deeply committed to understanding the significance of this um, plinth in um, the life of the city. Um, so I'll say just a couple of things about that before I pivot back to Johns Hopkins. Um, you know, on the one hand, um, I was someone who said um, Roger Tawney, um, in fact, wasn't a Confederate. And so why is he coming down in this wave of rethinking of monuments? Um, but the digging that I've done and that the Walters has done um, has taught us um, that by 1887, Tawney was um, a symbol adopted by those who were looking to um, hold on to and promote and refashion the memory of the Confederacy um, in their own time. Um, uh, William Walters is um, very much behind the installation of this monument, a tribute to Tawney because Tawney was the justice who opposed Abraham Lincoln when Lincoln suspended the writ of habeas corpus and left Confederate sympathizers in Baltimore 
detained, imprisoned, um, without process um, and without a timetable. Um, it was Tawney who had been their ally um, and had condemned Lincoln from his perch at the Supreme Court. Um, what I didn't tell Julia uh, more recently, and I know I'm in the weeds, but I, I really want to take us there for a moment, is that um, when this monument is planned, um, there is a bungled um, effort to uh, hold a ceremony uh, and to unveil it. And uh, Mr. Walters, it seems, works behind the scenes to maneuver and mastermind that. Um, but one of his allies is Daniel Coit Gilman, um, the president of Johns Hopkins, um, who reaches out to the um, Justice Waite, who is the chief justice at the Supreme Court in 1887, entreating him to come to Baltimore and be part of the ceremony. It's a longer story about the ceremony itself, um, but I use that illustration as a way of um, encouraging us um, here between Johns Hopkins and the Walters Museum, but more generally um, in our education and cultural institutions in Baltimore to appreciate that in this hard history of the mid-19th century, a history that was in so many ways interwoven with enslavement, yes, um, with the problems of freedom and citizenship, of course, with the memory of the Confederacy and the construction of lost cause mythology, our institutions were intertwined um, in moments like this one. Um, today, Kurt, I love this monument because it is an empty slate and um, Baltimoreans come here to enact all kinds of rituals, um, which is to say that our memories are still being made, right? The meanings of this history are still being written um, at places like this empty plinth. Um, and because I live um, just across the way, um, I have a fun collection of um, cleansing ceremonies, um, musical presentations, um, artwork, um, and more, all of which happens here in the absence of Justice Tawney, but very much in response to his having occupied this space for so long. So if I could go back. Um, our work at Hard Histories at Hopkins has been to examine the university's stories, its myths, um, those things that we have told about ourselves. Some of them are related to Mr. Hopkins, but they are, there are many, many stories that we tell about ourselves as a university. Um, this image is one of, um, one of the very first seminar rooms at Johns Hopkins. Um, it is the history and uh, politics seminar room um, presided over by uh, Herbert Baxter Adams. It's a fabled place. Um, but I wanted you to see it because I wanted you to see how um, from the university's very inception, we were at work creating a pantheon, um, a kind of memory, connecting ourselves to a memory of a mythical past. And while they're too small to see with um, any particularity, you can see in the upper recesses of the room um, portraits and busts. Um, there's at least one relief there. And all of them are this inaugural effort to situate the university in a mythical past. Um, and any of you who have been on our campus, or frankly, most any other, know that this tradition lives right, in the uh, display, the hanging, um, the, uh, the um, reverence even for um, portraits of the university grades. And so our work at Hard Histories is to look critically at this room, um, to ask about the meanings of the portraits that are here, and I might say the portraits that are not, um, the values that are embodied in a room like this and many others, um, and the values that are set to the side, um, and to use our research capacities um, to set to the side some of those myths um, and to tell a history, I think very much in the spirit of Julia's remarks, to tell a history that permits us to move into a 21st century um, that has its own imperatives, 
um, that it has its own values, that has its own aspirations, and in our view, should not be forever weighted down um, by these early expressions of who we were and what we valued. Um, so I work in a lab with undergraduate students who are in the university archives and public archives around the corner at the Maryland Center for History and Culture um, and more um, as young people who are ultimately the stewards of an institution like ours, its alumni, its trustees, its benefactors, um, are taking a lead role in rewriting our history, a history that I hope, and I think they do too, um, will serve us well as we move into this extraordinary and um, wholly unfamiliar on some days, 21st century. Um, so again, I'm so grateful for the chance to be here. Um, thank you all. Thank you so much, Martha. It's so fascinating to hear how the biographies of these founders are so intertwined, and it's um, a really great opportunity to hear about the, the ways in which, um, when we talk about history, you mentioned the word mythical. We don't often think of myth and history necessarily in the same statement or same sentence, right? Um, and it really, um, it really resonates, I think, too, with the work that you are doing, Kurt, at UVA. Um, could you share a little bit about how uh, the, the complications that are inherent in the narratives that institutions tend to tell of their histories kind of take on a kind of mythic quality and, and how that relates to your work at UVA? Oh, th th this is a lot to unpack. I first want to say thank you all for being here and thanks to Martha, Teresa, and Julia. I feel like I'm pinching myself. I'm, I'm punching above my weight class today. This is great. Um, I, I, there's so much to unpack here. I think it's interesting that we have three institutions and I'm at the only institution that isn't named after the founder, right? So, but I'm also at the place that the founder plays the most powerful role in shaping how the institution has thought about itself for 200 years. Um, and I think this, it, it maps onto a story about American history, right? He, is, he wanted to be known as the man who wrote the Declaration of Independence, who founded the University of Virginia and wrote the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom. The university, after it opens, and he's only alive for a single year, and then he dies. So my work has been uncovering what actually happens at the living university after he dies. But his presence, um, it's hard to escape at UVA, even though he's not a namesake. Um, and we deal with, we kept the Declaration of Independence. We like that. We see him as an apostle of liberty at UVA. Um, we, and until 2020, even had a sign on a garden wall at the uh, university that uh, credited him not only with designing the walls, but with building them. So we had a lot to unpack that uh, in, at the centennial, they wrote a ponderous five volume history. This is in 1919. The subtitle of which is The Length and Shadow of One Man. So he, he, the Jefferson Philia is everywhere at UVA and our job, really in two th starting in earnest in 2013 was to try to uh, decenter. We had to push Jefferson aside, push that myth out of the way so we could actually look at what was going on. And do you have the, the so, yeah, that, that one's perfect. So I don't know how, how easy this is to see, but um, the image that's on the left is from an 1850s map that um, they commissioned with the, it's my one, I have many favorite drawings of UVA. This is one of my favorites. Um, I don't know how well you can see it, but that is the lawn, right, with the rotunda in the distance and Jefferson's architectural design laying out in front of you. And the weather is clearly, right, 77, sunny and pleasant. There are beams of sunshine coming down from one side, right? I tell students, if you look closely, there's probably an angel blowing a bugle somewhere in there, and there's got to be a unicorn. And on the right, you have like storm clouds sort of proverbially over Charlottesville and Richmond in the distance, and then there's a rainbow leading to a garden behind the Pavilion 8. So this is the image of UVA, and I think all institutions, right, there's kind of a cult uh, mythology about what we are. This speaks so perfectly to UVA, right? We've been navel-gazing for 200 years, 
And we oh. used Jefferson as a way to write, tell everyone how important this university founded in a farm field in the middle of right, the largest slaveholding state in the United States in a center of concentrated slaveholding two miles from a hamlet, right? It's on, it was on a dirt road. So this is nowhere, and the initial focus is all on Jefferson is everything that embodies what's going on there. That continued right up until 2013. Um, in 2007, we had the first rumblings in Virginia of maybe we need to tell a different story, and this is when the state decided it was time to celebrate 400 years of Virginia as a political entity, and they issued not an apology, but a statement of profound regret for slavery. Uh, I don't know if this is true, but I like to joke that they did this at 4.59 p.m. on a Friday, turned off the lights on the State House, and everybody ran home. Our Board of Visitors followed suit a couple weeks later, and then in typical cult fashion that this, I think, image speaks to, decided we need to commemorate this moment. Um, so we apologized for slavery, and we put a plaque in the ground in an underground walkway. Um, so you have to, it's an outdoor walkway that's on the south end of the rotunda. Um, you have to walk through it. While you're walking, you have to stop at an archway, turn perpendicular to traffic, look down on the ground, and you read text that thanks the several hundred free and enslaved laborers who helped build the university from 1817 to 1826, thus realizing Thomas Jefferson's vision for the university. That, that, that's where we were in 2007. So we, we've really worked hard to get this myth pushed aside. Um, it's unbelievable how long that myth lasted and how it shows up every year on Founders Day in student productions. But what's interesting is what's always been hidden in plain sight is the way that this landscape is a story about slavery. And the image on the right that you're seeing is a zoom in of the building that's all the way on the left in the other image. That's Pavilion 9, and there's an enslaved woman holding a professor's child hidden in, right there in that image. So this story about slavery is everywhere at UVA if you just know where to look. And our job has been to decenter Jefferson, talk about this as a, a living landscape that professors, students, enslaved people, free people of color occupy for nearly 50 years. Um, and it's, it's hard work to get Jefferson out of the way. Um, he finds a way to keep creeping back into it. We wanted to do two things, right? Decenter Jefferson, make this, this story about human bondage at the university much more visible, and try to, in some cases at least, tell the stories of enslaved people as human beings who built and maintained the university for 50 years. So in the memorial that we'll come back to, we were uh, animated by this quote from a woman named Isabella Gibbons. She was enslaved at the university. She and her husband, who was enslaved by a different professor, taught themselves to read and write, taught their children to read and write, uh, and were leaders in the, the free community after 1865. And this is Isabella Gibbons in 1867. She's now back in Charlottesville as a teacher for the New England Freedmen's Aid Society, teaching free people in Charlottesville how to read and write. And she writes to the Freedmen's Journal to warn people about <laughs> the politics of the, these early days of Reconstruction. And what she's saying here is, can, can we, will we ever forget the horrible, the horrible cruelties of slavery? And she goes on to list them and says, no, we won't. So it's great. We're, we're honoring her words in some way. But she is not, in this quote, talking about just, she's, she, this is a warning to freed people everywhere that your white neighbors who so recently enslaved you and committed these horrible crimes on you and your, your ancestors are coming to you and extending the hand of friendship and you shouldn't trust them. And so I think this is a really interesting link to Martha, what, what you're working on with the lost cause. Um, UVA is, in essence, the coiner of the term the lost cause. It's a UVA alum in 1866 who writes a book called The Lost Cause, and he follows it up two years later with The Lost Cause Regained. So articulating uh, an explanation of right, Confederate defeat and the rightness of the ideas that undergirded the entire effort to create a slaveholding empire and right, leave the United States um, is, in effect, uh, 
created by a UVA alum who's a Richmond newspaper editor at the time. So I think she's really, really correct that um, the, the freed people <laughs> need to be warned about what's going on here. The, the university, though, immediately returns to back to its cult image, uh, but now filled with rage at the success of freed people. So we have a, we're, we're still just at the beginning. And if, can you back up to the, one of the big memorial pictures? Uh, I, I, I wouldn't have time today, we'd be here for three hours if I were to fully unpack that um, academical village landscape. But we built this memorial, uh, we it officially dedicated in 2021, but finished in 2020. Thanks to the pandemic, we had to wait a year and a half to dedicate it. But it's meant to be in direct conversation with that landscape I showed you in the earlier image. So it's 80 feet in diameter, which is the diameter of the rotunda dome. It rises to a height of eight feet on the interior, which was the height of these beautiful serpentine walls that enclose what are known as gardens at UVA. The gardens were workspaces for the enslaved that were attached to the dwellings, the pavilions that the professors lived in and what, again, in weird UVA lingo, we call hotels, but were the dining rooms. It's meant to document the 4,000 plus enslaved people who lived there, and I think some people see this uh, as an end. It's a beginning, right? This is the first really substantive intervention into a built landscape, um, and we're trying to do a lot more to keep deconstructing that myth and make it impossible if you come to UVA now you don't immediately drink the Kool-Aid and see it as 77 sunny and pleasant and it's just about right the Declaration of Independence in education. So I'll stop there. I'm sorry, I go on all day. Thank you, Kurt. Um, as we've heard from each of our panelists today, we've we have a pretty decent through line here about how how knowledge is. Uh, adding to the histories that we know about uh, these different institutions and, and how history is really built iteratively over time. It's not a fixed thing. It's not in textbooks as the, the history, right? Um, and of course, as we learn new histories, of course, there will be debate. And I think we're, we're often used to hearing about debate in classrooms and, and universities, but there's a lot of debate that happens in museums as well. And so, Julie, I was wondering if you could touch on a little bit about um, how we encourage multiple perspectives, how we handle debate in, in ways that the visitor may not know from walking into a museum. Sure, thank you. And I'm, I'm just going to say that I wouldn't be sitting here today with any good thoughts without having had a number of conversations with both Martha and Kurt. When I was first starting to think about this project, even before I arrived, I, I realized just how incredible Baltimore is as a place to make these make these connections and have these debates and dialogues. And that this is not, as Martha said, this is not a Walter story. This is a Baltimore story. This is actually a much broader story about America. And so we are really aiming to create these synergies amongst each other and, and to have that debate. We want to complicate people's understandings um, about what museums are, who are the people who are involved in it, and it is not at all supposed to be this omniscient narrator, and you walk in and you have this literal unspooling of the narrative that museums have told since, really since the 14th and 15th centuries, and we were just walking through the Chamber of Wonders. And that is truly the beginning of the physical enterprise of a museum is in the 15th and 16th centuries when people were beginning because of travel to be able to go out and collect the world. They were able to bring back the world to Western Europe. They were able to bring natural resources, silver, coffee, gold. They were able to trade. They were able to conquer. They were able to expand. And so this history that became iterative over time, and that was internally debated a little bit, but it was debated mainly in the, the, in the, in the service of conquest and economic um, power um, in the Western Judeo-Christian world. And so museums are, are really that story. And so you walk through a museum, and you start in Egypt, and you start with the pharaohs, and you end up with the Impressionists if you're in a museum like ours, or Fabergé eggs, right? And 
very often you've read a whole bunch of text, first of all, which presumes that you are able to read, which is the first presumption that I think that we need to correct. Um, and second of all, as Teresa said, that you know something, right? We, we assume a lot that you are walking in. And who is this who's writing these texts? And who made the decision to pretend that Egypt wasn't an African country but was a Western European country before Western Europe lived? I mean, when, when we say we have the largest collection of art created on the African continent between Richmond and Philadelphia, people go, huh? What are you talking about? Because apparently, we as museums have been really good at not having a debate about whether this art is art that was created in antiquity, in Africa, in a multicultural, vibrant African world. Um, so where does the debate occur? It used, to de it used to occur maybe between curators, maybe, but usually one curator did his or her work and wrote the labels and ne never would anyone else read those labels or comment on those labels and they'd get up on the wall and it was that person who was in charge so you'd have to ask who is a curator there's all this lineage and genealogy of curatorial you know who did you work with just like in academia but all of you don't know that so that's already you know invisible to all of you and then when you're in a museum you have you have all these programs and things that we do to enliven the collection or to expand the histories and expand the way to come, come through it. And yet, to Teresa's point, you don't know what it's taken to get us there. So what are the choices that we've made? Uh, still, we don't sign labels. And then when we try to sign labels, people are nervous about that because then is that diminishing the power of the narrative that we are putting forward? So what we are trying to do in this museum is through the programs that we have, through the exhibitions, particularly like the ones that we have on view now, Majolica, that looks at expanding our idea about the art, but is, it's also looking at the men and the women and the children who were actually harmed by being the artists and being, being open to debate and putting that out on the walls so that all of you can ask us questions or activating the Renaissance where we're um, putting contemporary works of art in, in juxtaposition physically with works that are, um, that are really not necessarily inspire, inspiring to the artists but have some relationship to the works by the contemporary artists so that you can have a, a visual, physical debate between two works of art that then means that we, as individuals experiencing that, will also have a conversation about why is this painting here? What is, what is the artist trying to do? Listening to the artist talk about that. So pulling these inanimate, non-obvious um, objects into a actual verbal dialogue somehow that expands beyond the 150 words that we know, all of us, that's our limit. We're not gonna read more than that on a label. Um, that it helps us to expand beyond that and not just to learn from it and not just to take it as is, but asks us to question what we are reading, what we are looking at. So that's really hard to do when you don't have people standing in the gallery all the time. So it's super important that all of you help us with this task by engaging with us, by coming to programs, by asking us questions, um, by reaching out to Martha and Kurt, and when you go to UVA, really treating it as a museum that you need to engage with physically. When you go to a seminar in Hopkins, you need to look around and look at whose portraits are on the wall, whose portraits aren't on the wall. Um, there's usually some king of some country in the, in the very distant past who's my friend, right? <laughs> That's why I have his portrait. So I think that it, it is the invisibility of the debate that we need to make visible and that we need to pull out. That is not an easy job in a museum, but it is our responsibility. So we're, we need your help and help us do a better job at that. And thank you for being here today to do that work with us. Thank you, Julia. So you shared a lot about um, the ways in which museums as a public space can, can encourage debate and dialogue. 
And to sort of flip it around with universities, we tend to think of universities as, as keeping that knowledge within its academic walls, right? Um, but both of you have done a lot of really incredible work in moving from history to public history. Um, and so I'm hoping that each of you, and I think this might be our last uh, time for our last question here, for me anyway, um, I'd love for you to, to speak to some ways that universities can move from history to public history, and also comment on who should be included in deciding what gets made public, and other of you can, can start. I, I, I can start. <laughs> um, thank you for the question, um, because I think uh, if, I'm not sure if the image is still available of that seminar room, um, but this scene has been really generative for us um, appreciating um, what a closed space this was. Um, it was designed to be an exclusive and an exclusionary space. It was imagined as a place where a highly select cadre of men um, would gather and share ideas, develop ideas, research ideas, sh share them with one another. Um, and so in our work, uh, it has been helpful to ask and to wrestle with what it means to open this space up. Um, because at Johns Hopkins, even today in 2022, we do what we do in seminar rooms. They don't quite have this look anymore. Not quite, but the portraits are still there. Julia is right. Um, how can we open that space up? Well, our work began um, in December of 2020 in a public way. Well, that's a heck of a time, isn't it, to try and figure out how to open it up. Um, but we immediately um, stepped into the possibilities of Zoom. Um, we realized that we could hold seminars, conversations, debates, present works in progress, speak with experts, um, as we would do in the seminar room, and we could now do it with a public. Um, no tuition required, no registration required. Um, just grab your brown bag lunch at noon um, and tune in, um, or come to our YouTube channel, and you can be part of the seminar room discussions that, um, for much of our past, have been closed. Here, we're trying to, mm, you know, lift the hood um, and invite non-historians, non-academic historians, um, to learn more about the way we work, the way we debate, um, the way we discover new evidence, how we weigh it, how we craft new narratives. Um, the uh, American Association of State and Local History has just published a fascinating new study on um, what the public would like most from us as historians. I'm interested in that. Um, and part of what they discovered in their survey research was that folks really did want to be invited behind the curtain or under the hood, um, rather than having historians come and sort of omnisciently tell you what is true. Um, and we all know that changes um, as our interpretation sharpen, as our evidence expands and more. Um, rather than us coming to you and telling you what's true about the past, inviting you on uh, what I think brought a lot of us to history, which is our fascination with the research, with the discovery, uh, with the mystery, and more. Um, so we have used um, Zoom seminars um, at noon to um, part the curtains, lift the hood, and invite folks to be part of what we do um, every day. Um, at the same time, um, in academic history, um, the timeline from when you finish thinking through an idea, you draft an article, it goes through peer review, and it finally sees publication and gets shared, is years, um, oftentimes many, many years. And for us, there was an urgency about this work, um, that folks really were not going to be 
um, satisfied, either in our community or in the broader community who was interested in our work. They just weren't going to be satisfied with waiting five, ten years um, to learn, finally, what we were discovering. Um, so today we, um, we publish a, a substack, or as they call it, the stack, um, which is twice a week um, an email blast that um, mostly I, but sometimes colleagues, um, really just offer a short window into what is happening um, in our work. This conversation, when the video is available, will become part of our Substack um, series um, as a way of speaking to folks regularly and in a more vernacular, colloquial voice, um, and to making the conversation about history, even academic history, not one that um, happens only in our um, refined, um, you know, ivory towered uh, spaces, um, but is really um, part of our everyday conversation. Um, so I thank folks who have tuned in and um, signed up. It's free, but um, tuned in, signed up, and take time to um, follow the journey with us as um, it continues. Um, and I hope that is. Um, one way of saying um, that we don't envision this work as only the purview of experts, um, not only the purview of folks at a seminar room at Johns Hopkins, um, that we recognize how deeply felt um, and the deep concerns that our work touches upon um, for many Baltimoreans, um, for many Marylanders and, and for, it turns out, folks in many other places as well. Um, so we strive, I think, to be responsive to that. And um, yeah, and I'll turn it over to Kurt. Can you go, Teresa, can you go back to that image of, of UVA? I, Martha, I just love it that you talked about that room as this right, exclusive cutting off the outside world. This is an entire landscape doing the exact same work, right? If you've come to UVA and you stand on that lawn, you can't see the outside world, you can't hear it. Uh, and this image is, right, it, it, the community represented in this image is faculty and students and no one else. Never mind that in 1825 there were more enslaved people living in that landscape than there were students and faculty combined. So our work, we did a couple things that speak to broadening this sense of community. We wanted to stop it from being an insular place that was cut off from the outside world. And as a note, I don't have an image here, but if you come to UVA now, the other side of the rotunda on the north side has this plaza with the Jefferson statue as the Apostle of Liberty, made by a Confederate sympathizer, uh, go figure. Um, and it looks grand, as grand steps leading up to it. Well, in Jefferson's design, that was the rotunda's back door. Right? It literally told the outside world, you aren't welcome here. It's deeply exclusionary as a space. And we wanted to break down the literal and metaphorical walls dividing us from the community we've been embedded in for, for 200 years. So to this question about public, we started with a, we have to go out into the community as we're doing this work. And we have to do, we're doing two pieces of work in doing that. One is, Truth-telling, right? We're now finally not just going to talk about Jefferson as the, this amazing man who created this university. Um, we're going to actually acknowledge the, the deeper history. The community already knew this history. Uh, Isabella Gibbons that I talked about earlier, we knew that because a, a lay historian in the community had done the research. So the community knew this story. They needed to hear us as an institution actually tell it, right? Go out and say, here's what we know. Um, but we also wanted to do that to pull in the community to say, right, this isn't just our story to tell. Um, enslaved people in this landscape were rented to the university. The university ever, only ever outright owned one person institutionally. Uh, everything else was driven by a highly commodified rental network that stretched, uh, is, we, we can't fully document how far away people uh, were from where they were enslaved initially before coming to UVA, but it's sometimes at least 70 miles. So, right, the story about that landscape, it, as soon as you start picking at the threads, it's a story about central Virginia, right? The roads, lead, the roads, the stories lead all the way to Richmond. So we had to include that larger community, break down that, the, the visual representation of this is walled out from the outside world, 
And in doing that, we're doing two things. We're educating our current student body and our alumni that, right, a, a lot of what you were told about your university, right, I, I, I'm an alum, back in the day, we were told Thomas Jefferson built the university. That was the, the narrative. We had to unpack that, and we ha we, we've now re re telling the story very differently and inserting new people into the story. And I think this gets to your second piece of the question. Who gets to tell that story? I, I, we have, we've, we've been very careful. I don't know that we've done a perfect job. I'm sure we haven't. But we're thinking very carefully about now that we're telling this fuller story, at what point do we need to make sure that the community has a voice in whose stories we tell and how we tell the stories? Um, I think the, the happy ending to this, uh, or maybe uh, optimistic ending to this, is we now have a descendant community. They form their own 501c3. And we don't have an institutional process for this yet, but every work to reinsert this, these stories into the landscape now uh, is vetted through them before we put anything up because it may not be our story to tell. Um, and I, I, I've really wrestled with this, right? Our work going into the archives, um, it's all publicly available material, but it's only trained scholars who really know where to look. And just as Julia, you were talking about, right, there's kind of a decolonization project at museums. Our work is part of a much larger project of decolonizing the archives. That one of the problems when you go into the archives, you have to know where to look. The material isn't often cataloged to tell these stories. And I'll give one quick example of this. I was going through, this is John Hartwell Cock. He's another person that there are portraits of hanging on walls. He is one of the founders of the university with Thomas Jefferson. He's a very large slaveholder in Fluvanna County. He rents people to the university, and he has one of the largest collections in our archives that's also one of the most cherry-picked. It's so big, people just kind of come in and they grab a couple things and, and quote it. Well, we just started sifting through it. And uh, we, we found in there uh, an entire series of letters about how they understand that what they're building is going to be land speculating, and they're gonna buy up all the land adjacent to the university, and they're gonna, in particular, remove the free people of color who own land near the university, which has a really long history um, beyond 1865 at UVA, this desire to keep it very exclusive and push away communities of color. Um, you wouldn't have found this reading it. You had to go in and look and go, oh, this is just two letters. They're talking about land at the university. And when you read it, they name the free black man whom they're trying to remove from the land and trying to figure out how to buy them all. I'll end with a good note on this, that um, the free black man negotiates with them for two years and they overpay, <laughs> they pay him thousands of dollars for the land. So uh, maybe a slightly good ending to, to that piece. One last example in another collection of our law professor there are letters to him. It includes the letters from a, a, a free black man who had been enslaved at the university and had to leave the state in the 1850s. He's found in violation of the removal law, which says after May 1st, 1806, if you are freed, you have to have explicit permission to remain or you can be right, arrested and sold back into slavery. So he leaves after buying his wife and four children and freeing them and moves to Ohio, and he writes to the professor, not begging for help, but writes to the professor to say, I'm old and tired. I have, I have $850 to buy my daughter, Rosea. Can you help me? This is, if you go look at the catalog record, it's not there at all. And so this is, to get back to this question, we're the ones doing the research, but I'm not really entirely sure anymore that it's always my story to tell, that we really need um, we need to decolonize the archives so this material can be found, but then we need to make sure we're talking to our local community and how to tell these stories. And we're, we're still figuring this out. I don't know anything about community engagement other than what I've learned through now about nine years of insistently doing the work. It's hard work. Thank you, Kurt, and, and thank you, Julia and Martha. That's a really great segue to open up to our community here. We have just um, a little bit of time for a couple of questions. And if you do have a question, I ask that you raise your hand and somebody will be giving you a microphone, one of our staff members. Um, we have a question down in front. Uh, you stated up at the outset the, that this self-reflection of his, 
well, you were spe speaking specifically to museums, has been going on for about 20 years, I think, you said. My question is, and I'm in it covering not just museums, but historical institutions in general, what confluence of events kicked this off? Was it the stars aligning, or were there just a series of, what, what brought it about? I'll take it from the museum um, perspective, and I'm gonna say that we haven't done a good job, right? Because our, our um, everyone has been trained to like temporary exhibitions, so we just cycle them through, and we've created um, a system in which people expect to see a certain thing, and so it's been really hard to move the ship. Um, so we have a lot more work to do, even if the desire has been kind of going for a long time. I think it has to do with the way in which art history, and I'll maybe think that history has also done this, this idea that there was one history, one way of thinking. It really started to break open um, because of historical inquiry and historical research. And I, as a historian of art, my whole field was uncovering the identities and the, the ways that women operated as power brokers in the 17th century in the courts of Louis XIV and Charles II, and there is no documentary evidence of that kind unless you are looking around and through documents. So having people like me, whose field was uncovering, expanding, um, trying to find ways to look at objects and facts differently because if I just look at them through the, through the straight and narrow, I'm gonna get the guy's version who had a very particular view of that woman. So as we move into the field of museums, we then inevitably change the way that we ask our, our colleagues, all of us, to do our work. So this notion of coming in, someone asked me the other day, why, why is this happening with you? And I think it's because I view myself as a cultural historian and I'm really interested in biography. So when I first arrived, we, we did the first exploration of William and Henry Walters as collectors that had ever happened in the museum. That was 80 years afterwards. I think maybe people were a little bit afraid of um, you know, going there because they probably thought they were gonna find some things. So we started out by looking at them as collectors. That laid the groundwork for us to open up the stories of people and um, the, then we went to one West Mount Vernon place where we were looking at the Hanson Tho the Th John Hanson Thomas and then the people who were there, the work workmen um, who worked on the house, the architects, S we found Sibby Grant totally by accident. Actually, the students at the Baltimore School for the Arts, they did a guerrilla Black History Month project where they went around Mount Vernon and they zip-tied to all of the houses in which they found um, records of enslaved individuals in the 1850 census or 1860 census. And one morning we came to work, all of us, and there were zip-ties on, on Hackerman House. And so that was community work. So long-winded answer. It has to do with the kind of historical research that the individuals who are now working in the museums were taught to do. That is what's driving the change within the museums. But because of the business model of museums where we've, again, trained people to only want to see Van Gogh, and now we do that in a warehouse with, you know, not even just with sound and light show, um, that, that it's hard to move the ship. So sorry, that was really, I took it over from you guys. Um, I th at least at UVA, and I think this is common at universities, they're a little different, right? They're, they're historic sites, but they're living, breathing institutions that every four years have thousands of people who just arrived and know nothing about the institution. And for us as a predominantly white institution, right, it's the uh, after co-education, and integration, we get to a moment in the late 1990s where it's students increasingly going, who's represented on the walls? Where, where am I anywhere in this landscape? And then often working with faculty doing little projects. So information dribbled out from the mid 90s on about our story at UVA and it wasn't until students 
walked over that plaque I talked about earlier and rightly went, this is the, this is the most terrible acknowledgement of human bondage I've ever seen, right? It, it, it fails repeatedly in, what, for, you know, a, a, a tweet, basically. So those students formed their own student group called Memorial to Enslaved Laborers and did uh, awareness raising activities, including a memorial design competition. Not for a memorial that was going to be built, but for a way to let's think creatively about how do we change representation at the university. And that was in 2010, and within three years, we had a full-blown commission doing the work. So I think it's, uh, the moment was, 20, late 20th and 21st century students just pushing over and over again for, right, we, we need to represent who we are now, not who we were when we were a slave society. I'll just add, um, I don't think you can tell this story um, without appreciating um, the force of Dr. Ruth Simmons at Brown University, who 20 years ago, um, when she took over the helm at Brown, its first African-American woman president, um, and she began to hear talk right, and more about Brown's long and intimate connections to the slave trade and to slavery. Um, Dr. Simmons did not flinch. Um, she did not look to sweep it under the rug. She did not double down on the mythical tellings of Brown's past, and instead, initiated a commission, um, a series of institutes and more um, that I think continue to be a model for the work that many of us do in universities studying slavery. Um, now, we could tell a whole story, right, about how Dr. Simmons becomes Dr. Simmons, ultimately President Simmons, which is essential to that story, but I think her intervention and her deep commitment to fact-finding and truth-telling um, and following the record wherever it was going to take them at Brown um, continues to be um, embody the values and the principles that I think in, in, in inform a lot of our work. And it is, for me, um, a model of courage. Um, that courage in ourselves and our capacity to do the work, um, to face the histories that are difficult, um, to as institutions incorporate them into who we are and perhaps even be changed and stronger by virtue of that. Um, for me, Dr. Simmons' work, and, and she continues today at Prairie View A&M University, um, that kind of courage in the face of, you can only imagine, right, what came to her, right, in her ears, whispered in her email and more um, about why this was a risky, why this was an unfortunate, why this would be a regretful undertaking. Um, she taught us how to be courageous in the face of, um, of those concerns. Thank you so much, Martha, and that's a really wonderful uh, story to end on. We are actually uh, past time, and um, we only thank you so much for that provocative question that resulted in so many interesting answers. And um, we hope to continue the dialogue again. This is the first of, of a series of programs called The Depths of History, and we look forward to welcoming you back and continuing this really important conversation. Thank you all so much. <laughs>